So, uh, it actually happened. I can't really believe I'm saying it, but today we're going to be taking a look at Steve's hitboxes. What a strange time we live in. By all accounts, I do believe that Minecraft deserves a spot in Smash just because of how impactful and important it is to gaming as a whole. But I never thought it would actually happen. In any case, Steve is certainly a weird character. He is remarkably unique as far as character designs go. There's never really been anything quite like him before, and that does show in his hitboxes. So, why don't we take a look? Today's hitboxes were created by Zekemaru. As usual, there are links to everything in the description. And if there's a character you want me to cover in the future, let me know and I'll consider it for next time. Now, I am sorry to disappoint you all when I say that Steve's hitboxes are in fact spherical. I know, even I'm a little disappointed here, though it would probably be a bit of a nightmare to make the visuals for them if they were square hitboxes. Just felt like I needed to address that grievance I'm sure many of you had. Alright, actually starting with the hitboxes now. There is a lot to unpack about this character, so let's take it from the top. Steve has a meter. What self-respecting DLC character doesn't these days? It's filled up with various resources, which you can get by mining the ground. A bit more on this when we come to his specials. With these resources, you can craft variations of the tools Steve uses. You start out with wood and can craft stone, iron, gold, and diamond versions of the tools if you have the resources. Once you craft any tool with a given resource, all other tools also turn into that version. You don't have to craft them all individually. Depending on what material they're made of, his attacks have differing damage and frame data. Diamond being the strongest, followed by iron, then stone with wood and gold being tied for the weakest. However, gold comes out a few frames faster and has less lag, generally speaking. This applies to all moves that use the tools. But keep in mind that there will be a variance depending on which one you use. The tools have their own durability and can break. The durability naturally depends on what kind of material they're made of, which I'll be displaying on the screen right now. This is the max durability of all the tools of every material. Every move that uses the given tool has a predetermined amount of durability spent on a land hit, which you can see here as well. Once it hits zero, the tool breaks, and you'll have to craft a new one. Now with all of those explanations out of the way, it should go a little quicker. Steve can use his jab while moving and jumping, similarly to Mega Man. As a result, he has no designated neutral air or F-tilt, as his jab serves both functions. The hitbox looks like this. It has eight hitboxes, which are effectively four hitboxes overlaid, half of which hits aerial opponents and the other hits grounded, with with some differing angles. The hitboxes are all the same between all the tools in terms of size, however like I said gold is a bit faster, in this case coming out two frames faster and having two less frames of lag. If your sword is broken you'll be using your fist instead, which has a significantly smaller hitbox, only being two hitboxes overlaid and the move is significantly weaker. In addition, if you do a short hop and hold the direction slightly, you'll get a variation of that move that reaches a little farther forward and can also hit behind Steve. The hitboxes are mostly the same though. Down tilt is actually a rare tilt projectile. Steve spawns a fire that burns for a while until it launches the opponent away. The fire can be started on the ground or in the air when standing on a ledge. If so, the fire will fall down while it's active, which can make for an effective ledge guard against some characters. The hitbox looks like this. It's two decently sized hitboxes that keep the opponent inside the move until the finisher is active, which launches away. It's not super powerful, but it is a nice move to have. This next one is a mean one. Steve's up tilt is kind of gross. He swings his axe above his head in an arc. The move is really fast, with very little lag relatively speaking. And the hitboxes are way bigger than they have any right to be. It has a lot of active frames and covers a very big amount of area during the swing, covering both behind and in front of Steve, which is a very good quality in an up tilt. It makes for a great tool when you're in pressured situations. And not to mention that it's super disjointed upwards, making it a solid anti-air move. If that wasn't enough, the move is also a combo starter into various other moves. The only problem with it really is that it might be too tall in some cases meaning you might be able to low profile under it. But when you can use the move like three times in a second, it honestly might just not matter that much. Without the axe, it is a little less impressive, but surprisingly still quite usable. I would say this is probably one of Steve's best neutral moves, and will at least guarantee that he has something to do when he feels pressured. It also happens to be his upper, however, when used in the air, it actually has even less lag, though the hitbox is pretty much the same. Unlike up till this one launches at a set angle in front of him. It is a pretty great move and has some very strong combo potential. On the other hand, dash attack is a little less impressive. The hitbox itself is fine, but the novelty of a dash attack is a bit lesser when you have moving tilt attacks. It has good range and active frames, but it has a lot of lag afterwards, making its risk arguably not really worth it a lot of the time, since using a neutral attack is often just a lot safer, though it might be good for catching landings, if you feel confident in a read since it does get you into play slightly faster. Perhaps it's not his best move, but it's okay nonetheless. As for grabs, Steve's grab is a tether grab. It's certainly unique starting out as a grab in front of him, and then having it go on an arc into the air before landing on the ground. It has pretty good range, being among the longest grabs in the game. Dash grab and pivot grab are just about the same as well. Okay, so while I usually don't show throw hitboxes, today I'll make a quick exception. Here is down throw where Steve just drops an anvil on the opponent after grabbing them. Quite blunt and brutal. 
forward air is another quirky move. It is a swing with a pickaxe hitting in front of Steve. The odd thing about it is that the earlier frames are actually sour spots, while the later hits are the sweet spots, bringing a little subversion of your expectations there. It has four hitboxes, the usual aerial and grounded overlap. During the earlier frames, it simply launches away and deals damage. On the ground, if you hit the sweet spot, it also just launches them away, but with more power. However, if you hit the sweet spot on an aerial opponent, that's where the fun begins. Because in that case, the move straight up spikes them, launching them down into the side. Without a pickaxe, the move looks like this, not quite as impressive, with a straight up negative disjoint. I don't think you'll be using this very often. While it might be hard to connect the spike because it's on the later hit, I would say the reward is certainly worth it. It seems like a pretty great move either way though, even if you don't land the spike. Back air is quite similar to forward air in a lot of ways. It's also a swing with the pickaxe, though this time behind him. It has the same delayed sweet spot that forward air has, however, back air's sweet spot does not spike. It is, however, very powerful regardless. The movie is noticeably slower than forward air, but compensates in raw power and hitbox size, being bigger than forward air. Aside from that, there's not too much to say about it, it's just a powerful move that hits hard. Nice to have given how he already has other fast moves to use. Down air is quite interesting. Steve spawns an anvil under him and quickly falls down. You can stay on the anvil riding it down or jump off after a while. If you do, the anvil will just keep falling. However, for as long as Steve is on the anvil, it is stronger, dealing significantly more damage. The hitbox looks like this. It's just about the size of the graphic, so it's nice and easy to comprehend. It's very strong and can be great for relieving pressure when you're in disadvantage. And even off stage, it can be a great tool for edgeguarding opponents who try to use predictable recoveries. The only thing about it that makes it a little worse is the fact that it requires you to have iron to be able to use it. If you don't, the move simply does nothing. The same is actually true for his down throw as well, since it also uses an anvil. So keep an eye on the meter from time to time. Steve's up B sees the return of the gliding mechanic that was previously absent from Smash Ultimate. A pretty welcome re-edition in my opinion. I always thought this mechanic was a lot of fun, even if it was never super broken. Uh, <laughs> not counting Brawl Mennonites. At first glance, it might not even seem like it has a hitbox, but it actually does. Granted, it's not exactly too much to write home about. It starts up being just a little smaller than its body, and gets even smaller than that later on in the move. It's very weak and deals almost no damage. It's clearly more of a recovery tool than anything. Side B is the minecart. Steve builds some tracks and shoots away on the ground. There are two versions of this move, one with a redstone boost and one without. As that might imply, you need redstone to use the faster version. The faster version is a fair amount more powerful and, well, obviously goes faster. The hitboxes are the same across both versions. When you are riding the minecart, it looks like this. It's pretty normal and almost a little underwhelming, but when you jump out, it turns into this interesting arrangement of hitboxes. The hitboxes on the sides are aerial only and simply launches away. The orange one in the middle, however, is a search box that will trap you inside the minecart if you get hit by it, in which you have to mash to get out or uh, face the consequences, which can be pretty brutal if it catches you off guard. When first initiating the move, it requires iron to make the minecart, and while you're putting on tracks, it just seems to spend the lowest valued resource in your meter. Don't really know how Steve is laying tracks made out of dirt, but hey, sometimes it's just best to not ask questions. TNT is Steve's down B. He places a block of TNT on the ground, and afterwards you have the option of leaving a redstone trail after you, leading away from the TNT, where you can place a pressure plate to trigger the explosion on command, or simply wait for it to blow up on its own. When detonated with the pressure plate, the move is a lot stronger and has a very impressive hitbox covering a huge area. The inner circle is the sweet spot packing a massive amount of damage if you can land it. After two frames, the move looks like this before the move is over. An interesting thing about this move is that when you use the pressure plate to explode it, the hitbox's friendly fire does not activate until frame 3, at which point the sweet spot is already gone and only the sour spot remains, which means that it is impossible for Steve to get hit by the most powerful part of the move, should you be too close to the explosion, which is considerate, I suppose. When the TNT explodes on its own, the hitbox is about the same, but it is significantly weaker. This is a fun move and can likely lead to some very interesting interactions I imagine. Now neutral B is the mining, which obviously doesn't have a hitbox, but I guess I can briefly go into how the mining works in case you were wondering. Every stage in the game has an assigned terrain type, which determines at what frequency Steve will mine specific resources. For the purposes of the mining, there are four in total. Dirt, wood, stone, and iron. However, it is important to note that the mining itself is not random, and all the terrains follow a predetermined pattern. For example, you'll get the first diamond after the same amount of mining every time, every match. Granted that it is the same terrain type. However, all the terrain types do have different rates. Obviously, you'll be getting more iron when mining an iron surface as opposed to a dirt one. These different terrains require you to use the appropriate tool for mining them, meaning you'll be using a shovel to mine dirt, an axe to mine wood, and the pickaxe to mine stone and iron, leading to you breaking certain tools more often on some stages as opposed to others, which again will affect your other moves. It's a fun little dynamic. Some stages have several terrain types, but a majority of the legal stages only have a single one per stage. So briefly let's go through all the legal and conceivably legal stages and see what they have. Battlefield is stone, 
Small Battlefield is also stone. Final Destination is dirt, which is a little weird. Dreamland and Yoshi Story are the only exceptions here having two types each, with Dreamland having dirt on the ground while the platforms are wood, with Yoshi Story being the opposite, having wood on the ground while the platforms are dirt. Or wool, in this case, which is purely a cosmetic change. Fountain of Dreams is dirt. All the Pokémon stages are stone, that being Stadium 2, Unova, and Kalos. Lilight is iron, being the only legal iron stage. Smashville is wood, and Town and City is wood. As for the Omega and Battlefield versions, they all use the same rate at which the resources are pulled. Despite this, they still use the same animation of what the terrain usually is, which is a bit confusing, but don't worry, the rate is the same across all stages. Neutral B also doubles as the block placing button, and will place a block below Steve if you're in the air. There is obviously no hitbox here, and I don't have too much to say about the blocks themselves either since they are fairly self-explanatory. They disappear after a while or can be destroyed by attacking them. Blocks made of higher value resources last longer. There is also a few restrictions on where you can place them, and closer to the edges of the map the blocks dissipate faster to prevent camping. Aside from that, the sky's the limit. <laughs> quite literally. Lastly, but not leastly, we'll be taking a look at his smash attacks. Steve spawns a magma block above him, which repeatedly deals damage to the opponent if they are trapped within the move. It also has a hitbox in front which launches up into it. After all the multi-hits, there are two hitboxes which launch away. The hitbox that lingers is pretty huge and can be nice for catching landings as a result, though if you miss, you are stuck in a lot of lag, so it's a bit of a risk. F-Smash is a pretty standard F-Smash, but you know, sometimes that's just what you want. It has three hitboxes all of equal strength. In other words, there are no sour spots to speak of. It's simply launches away, and depending on what material the sword is made of, it will deal differing knockback. And as always, the gold is a little faster on the frame data side. If you have a broken sword, the hitbox looks like this, and is obviously weaker. But all things considered, it's a pretty good F smash. Finally, we have Down Smash, which has Steve dropping lava on both sides of him. The first few frames stun you briefly in place, before the actual lava launches you away. The hitboxes themselves are pretty solid here, covering a lot to both sides of Steve. The move also deals a nice amount of damage. One thing you need to be aware of though, is that the move is actually a projectile, for some reason meaning that it can be reflected, so keep that in mind. The lava also follows gravity for a brief bit, if you use it at the ledge, which can be useful for ledge guards if you time it right. But that's going to do it. What a bizarre character this is. I guess that is almost a bit of an understatement, since they had to rework large portions of how the game worked to even make it happen. But I gotta say, I actually really like this character. He might be one of the most complex characters in the game, there's just a lot to keep track of at all times when playing him. Now with that said, I kinda hope the next DLC character is a little less crazy. And a bit more down to earth. It's fun to see them test out some unexplored design area for these characters, but a bit more of a normal character I think is in order. But until that time comes, thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.